Okay. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Ruth Nanjala. Welcome to the My Science Journey webinar series. Today we are privileged to be hosting the inaugural Welcome Sangha Excellence Fellow, um, Dr. Umi Kuyate. She is from the Gambia and um, I'll just read a brief bio about uh, her work, but she's here with us, so feel free to ask her any questions that you might have uh, regarding science or anything that is related to science. Cool. So Dr. Umi Kuyate is an excellence fellow at the Welcome Sangha Institute and a junior research fellow at Wolfson College uh, in the University of Cambridge. She is interested in understanding childhood risk respiratory microbiome and how it is affected by environmental factors such as air pollution, disease incidence, and antibiotic exposure. She holds a biochemistry degree from the University of College London, and this was jointly funded by the MRC, the Medical Research Council, and the Medical Research Foundation. After her undergrad, she went on to do a PhD on the Welcome Trust host pathogens and global health PhD program, and this was uh, this was at the University of Edinburgh, and here she used metagenomics to understand host virus coevolution in insects. During her PhD, she was awarded a Valley Gladwell Valley Gladwell sorry traveling fellowship in insect ecology, and this was by the University of Oxford. And as a University of Edinburgh student uh, at that time. And this led her to sort of do a bioinformatics workshop at the University of the Gambia. Outside of her research, she is interested in cooking, going for long walks and reading. She's also passionate about increasing the representation of women and people of African descent in STEM. Over to you, Dr. Umi. Uh, thank you so much, Ruth, for that um, introduction. Um, thank you everyone for coming. So I think um, briefly, I'll just give like a very short talk about my science journey and then you get to know me a bit more. So let me start. So I thought I'll start by my career path. So after my A-levels at Marina International School in the Gambia, I did an undergraduate degree in biochemistry at University College London. Um, which was jointly funded by the Medical Research Council and the Medical Research Foundation. So after my PhD, I was awarded a Welcome Trust for your PhD program um, by in host pathogens and global health at the University of Edinburgh. And the first year of the program was a Master's of Research in Global Health. And then my PhD was done in the following years, which I completed last year. During my PhD, I was also awarded a Valley Gradwell Traveling Fellowship in Insect Ecology by the University of Oxford. So after my PhD, I am currently, um, which I started last year, an excellence postdoctoral fellow at the Welcome Sanger Institute in the Parasites and Microbes with the Stephen Bentley's group. Um, I am also a junior research fellow at Wolfson College, University of Cambridge. So these two fellowships run concurrently at the same time. So I just thought first, um, I'll just say like a briefly uh, what I do on my day to day and the questions I am interested in answering. So my research overview is on pneumonia. Pneumonia uh, is the leading cause of infant mortality. It is caused by the inhabitants of the human respiratory microbiome. So uh, I am interested in having a full picture of the um, respiratory microbiome of African children and how this respiratory metagenome in childhood and how it is impacted by environmental factors. So I want to know how antibiotic exposure, uh, carbon monoxide and particulate matter, nicotine, incidences of respiratory disease and um, administration of the pneumococcal vaccine impacts this microbiome. And the hope is we can use this information in the diagnosis of some of these diseases in the meningitis belt of Africa. So um, now that you've uh, known what my research area is briefly, I thought it would be good since it's about my science journey 
to just talk about um, my personal experience and my career so far from the Gambia to the UK. So what has helped me so far first? I say mentorship. Um, I found having mentors quite important because um, especially black women mentors and women mentors because they can relate to a lot of the um, problems that I might face in my career because uh, mentors can support, uh, my, support my growth, give constructive feedback and offer guidance. They can also um, help provide opportunities and also build connections. Um, so for example, um, some of the connections that I've had and some opportunities that have come my way, like um, being sitting on success on the board, it was a mentor of mine who knew about it and told me about the program and I applied for it. But one of the most important things is finding the right mentor and also being very proactive um, in the relationship. Um, so I am quite proactive. I, uh, my mentors always look out for me, but I also make sure that I always keep my own end of the bargain by doing what I'm meant to do and um, listening to their constructive feedback. Um, so for people who can want to find mentors here, I'll say um, LinkedIn, at work and at conferences. Another thing that I found to be quite useful is finding mentors outside one's field. For example, um, one of my mentors um, is a businesswoman. She was actually voted, you know, top 100 of the most influential um, businesswomen in the UK. And, you know, she sits on 60, 250 companies. So having someone like that to go out for coffee with, let's say, every two to three months, um, it's nice to have someone outside of my field who can listen and actually offer feedback and I can learn from some of the business methods and things that has, she, she has used to be very, very successful in her career as a woman in business and find ways to actually apply that to my research. So I try to have mentors who are in academia, outside of it, and some who uh, have nothing to do with research. And sometimes even this mentorship relationship doesn't have to be formal, like there are people who've mentored me and didn't even know that, that they have. Like perhaps I run into someone at a conference or I met someone at work and they ask, oh, how are things going? And I have a question and they've given me advice that have changed um, the course of my career without them even knowing that they've mentored me. And um, so uh, now that we've talked about mentorship, um, other things that have helped me so far, I've mentioned mentors, being consistent in my work, um, because there's a saying that, um, you have to be prepared to maximize opportunities that come your way. So being consistent in your work and delivering excellence as much as you possibly can, especially as a visibly Muslim black woman, is very important that I stay on top of my game because of being existing in this intersection. And networking has been quite beneficial in my career as well. Um, networking with people, um, having um, just knowing what people who have done stuff and things, challenges that they feel to learn from them and also taking the initiative and stepping out of my comfort zone and also reaching out for people and asking for help but also taking responsibility for my development that has been a bit um scary in the beginning um reaching out to people especially people that i don't know just cold email them but i found that people are quite receptive a lot of the time and most of the time if they don't respond it's perhaps not even anything personal they just probably busy um but most people are quite helpful and another thing is being confident in my ability. That has taken a lot of time for me to actually accept it and stay in my power and realizing and accepting that I am here because I deserve everything that comes my way. Because of course, um, existing in these spaces does come with a lot of imposter syndrome, but trying to fight that and realizing that that's not my problem and I am equally worthy and deserving of everything that comes my way and being confident applying for things. Um, that has always been quite um, beneficial and advocating for myself. Like I always say, um, never reject yourself without giving a panel a chance to reject you. So if I find something that I want to apply, I apply for it. The worst that's going to happen is someone sending me an email saying, no, they're not going to beat me, but I will not reject myself. So yeah, those are things that I found helpful in uh, my career so far. Of course, uh, it doesn't come with chat. There's a lot of challenges. Another one of which the first one will be imposter syndrome, um, which happens a lot, especially with women in academia and women in a lot of um, high impact careers, um, feeling that um, she was a black woman, black, visibly black Muslim woman, feeling that perhaps I'm not good enough. And this has come sometimes pushed me to work 
um, hard, uh, push myself to work harder than I probably shouldn't and maybe prioritize myself a bit more. So that's something that uh, we, I still battle with sometimes. And of course, with immigration, um, I came to the UK as an international student, you know, not feeling like I can actually relax, always having to find the next thing to keep, you know, to keep me in the UK until I get federal status. So that has been quite a challenge, but that's sorted now. And like I mentioned earlier, being a visibly black um, Muslim woman and um, nothing I did put academia with question mark because this constant thing, do I stay in academia? Do I leave? So I'm, I'm constantly being in that battle. And um, another challenge would be homesickness because, you know, my family is in the Gambia and I'm living in the UK. Of course, I do have a family there and I've created a life for myself there by having friends and there, but um, that also can cause a challenge and trying to have a work-life balance that sometimes as well um like I said there is the pressure to always work hard to always deliver but um learning to prioritize my health and my mental health and knowing that that comes first and work and everything else um, comes secondary so that um trying to find that balance has been um, quite challenging for me so now that we've, I've discussed my personal experiences and some of my challenges, and um, I know that a lot of people in the call here were just quite curious about uh, an academic career and uh, just, you know, gen careers in general. So I thought it would be important for me to just talk about some useful tips that I found and looking back, some advice that I've given myself, my, a younger me. So yeah, some of the useful information that I'll say is the first thing, uh, especially for people wanting to study uh, for the study, I'll say know what you want to study and why. Um, that's quite important because you need to actually convince a partner if you're looking for scholarships and fellowships. You need to tell them why you want to do this kind of work and why. Um, another thing, you know, use social media to your advantage. Like I found some Twitter pages like Scholarship Region um, quite useful because they do post a lot of opportunities uh, across the globe constantly. And always apply on time and to the right program because I know a lot of people, it does happen. In fact, people tell, tell me um, that, oh, I was meant to apply for this, but the deadline has passed. So again, it goes back to taking personal responsibility and make sure that, because at the end of the day, you're, you're the person that's responsible for your career. Nobody cares because everyone has their own career to be responsible for. So you have to be responsible for your own career and believing in yourself like i said not rejecting yourself and accepting that rejections are quite normal um everyone goes through it uh, i remember when i was applying for a phd i applied for what eight positions or seven positions um had like uh five interviews got rejected from three of my interviews and got two offers so it happens sometimes you know i get rejections all the time last day i applied for a grant I did not get it. It happens. So uh, there's an element of luck. So uh, I know sometimes people always put up the success stories online, but as much as you'll say, oh, I got awarded X, I got awarded Y, I got this grant, I got that grant. But there's also a lot of um, rejections that also come oh, behind the scene. And I think it's important that, I think it's quite uh, uh, important that um, we are quite honest about it and realizing that there's a lot of luck in these things and not to take it personal if you're rejected, just try and use that information and um, incorporate that. Um, more useful information, I'll say, um, like I said, know your stuff. You need to actually, um, the world can be very unforgiving for people who look like us, if we're just being honest. So it's important to know your stuff and make sure you um, stay on top of your game. And um, also, like I said, uh, seek mentorship. Having a mentor is very important and very instrumental because sometimes we need people who just say, you know what, it's okay. Like I remember once um, I was going through a lot at the time and I spoke to a mentor and they said, listen to me, you're smart, you're capable and you can get this done. And I think I needed to hear that because there were times during even during my PhD, even during this fellowship that I just want to cry, you know, sit down and cry like I've had enough. And having someone just say, you've got this, um, is quite important. And prioritize your mental health. And um, that's the most important thing. You are more important than the career. 
believe in yourself um, network and maintain relationships and also uh, very importantly pay it forward i try to pay it forward with people coming up by um whenever i find opportunities i send it to people and i try to um so students reach out to me oh they have an interview or uh, they have their personal statements or cv reviews and i try to of course i can't um respond to everyone but i try to do I try to pay it forward because those things were done for me. So I try to pay it forward as much as I possibly can. So um, that's it. That's generally it. So today I just thought I'd just give a quick chat about uh, my career path, what I do, um, challenges I've found um, along the way, and information that I just thought would be quite useful for people um, wanting to study. So yeah, on that note, I'll say merci beaucoup. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening. And um, you can reach me. These are my two emails, my Sanger email or my Cambridge. That's me on Twitter, now X. I don't, I can't really believe I still call it X, but, um, and you can also find me on LinkedIn. Uh, yeah, time for questioning. Um, ready to take, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Umi. That is so inspiring. And uh, thanks for sharing your story with us. Uh, and now the floor is open for questions. If you have a, any questions, just feel free to raise your hand um, and then I'll hand it over to you, pass it over to you. Or if you don't want to speak, you can also type in the chat box and then uh, I can read it out loud. OK, cool. So while you're doing that, uh, so Umi, I know you talked a lot about mentorship and, and um, how important that has been for you, especially uh, when faced with challenges. But you know, a lot of um, a lot of people easily give up because I know people that have done like over 15 to 20 applications and probably they haven't gotten into any of that. Um, what, how, how are you able to overcome that uh, phase of when you're faced with like such challenges where you keep getting rejections, how how did you overcome that? Um, that's a very good um, point. I think uh, what I try to do is just like, when it happens, I acknowledge my feelings. But in them, like, you know, it is a big deal. This is something I wanted and I didn't get it. So I'll probably sit in it. If it requires me crying, <laughs> calling my mom or my family to rant, I'm like, ah, you know, just sit in it and acknowledge my feelings. And then some. I also try to, once I've um, kind of like um, resettled, I sometimes try to reach out to the organization and be like, you know, I didn't get this, but if I can get feedback, that would be useful. And sometimes it could be to a particular PI asking for feedback and try and incorporate that into... Um, my future applications, um, which is uh, like I remember, for example, when I was writing my personal statement for PhDs in undergrad, the first one, I, the first three I sent, I didn't get any, um, I did not get interview or even called back for. So I was quite salty, but then I took my personal statement and spoke to people that I kept as mentors at the time. I remember um, a very brilliant scientist, um, Brenda Kwambana, uh, she's Zimbabwean, she looked at it and she said, uh, looking at this personal statement, all you're talking about is, oh, my name is Umikiyota, you know, I'm, a, I'm expecting a first class degree, I've got X, Y, Z. But then you have to realize that everybody applying to these PhDs, 90% either have a first class degree or a 2-1. So that doesn't matter. But rather, talk about your research experience and actually tell them why you stand out. And when I took that feedback into it, I actually realized and I started getting more interviews so um i say sometimes like ask um for feedback and it's always good when you're applying for things like i said people apply for 20 and gone on rejections from all of them that does happen but what i'll say is it can sometimes we may just want to get to a particular institution and just targeting those and a lot of these things can come they can be very random so i'll say it's also good to have like backup options if a doesn't work Try B. If B doesn't work, you know, try something else um, until we can get to our ideal. So it's, it's good to also be a bit more open minded and flexible with um, what we do. So, yeah, those are, that's what I'll say. Thank you for that response. And also, just still, still within that conversation, um, could you please let us know how you're able to 
get these uh, scholarship opportunities other than just like uh, sort of LinkedIn and probably Twitter or something. Uh, is there are there any specific websites that you are able to sort of like pick most of these scholarships from when they are advertised? And also, could you talk about uh, some of them, for instance, the MRC, the MRF and the Excellence Fellowship? Um, so I just mostly do online and like I know find a PhD.com just put global PhD and another thing that you can do some rules are not advertised I'll say if you're interested in a particular lab or particular PI uh, there's nothing wrong with sending an email to them or members of their teams and saying oh you know this is me attaching your CV I'm interested in XYZ uh, are there any opportunities sometimes they might have um, things that are not advertised so it's good to reach out as for the MRC, I think that was just mere luck, to be honest, because uh, when I finished my uh, A-levels, I got an offer to study biochemistry at UCL. Uh, but of course, the tuition at the time was so expensive. Uh, my brother was studying at the time, like I just couldn't afford it um, at that time. So I was like, OK, I'll take this year out to regroup. Um, at that time, I just worked briefly in a bank. I was like an assistant printing stuff. But I'm going to spend this year to just fully focus on looking for scholarships. So I always flipped through the newspapers at the time um, every morning and I was flipping and I saw ah, MRC actually has one and looking to want a Gambian. So I remember, I was like, okay, I'll give that a shot. So I went to the interview uh, with my offer for biochemistry for UCL because they were like, oh, any course at any UK university. I'm like, great. I want to study biochemistry at UCL. Would you fund me? So they gave me the scholarship and that's how I got that. Um, also with... Um, for the Edinburgh one, I think during my final year undergrad, I was thinking about what I wanted to do next. So um, I was just applying for PhDs. At the time, it was very difficult because, you know, finding PhD that would fund an international student was quite hard. So that's how the Edinburgh one came about. The Sanger one, I was literally on Twitter once and someone tweeted it, retweeted it. I was like, oh, mm -hmm. OK, that sounds interesting. I opened that tweet. I did not want to apply. I remember going to my PhD supervisor. I'm like, this sounds so competitive. Because at the time, they said they were going to fund one. Oh. But, or two, yeah, on the advert. But they ended up funding three. I'm like, um, this is the entire UK. How can I possibly get that? He was like, uh, yeah, just apply. Why not? And I got it. Because even my PhD as well, I did not want to apply. Because it was six positions. Five were UK, EU. And one was international. And I remember telling my personal tutor, they're looking for an international student, the entire <laughs> world. They're trying to find one person. <laughs> I'm a third year undergrad. Like, why should I apply? Because UCL had one and they were funding one international student. And I remember emailing the person who was at UCL. He told me, yeah, only apply if you're really good. And when I got that email, I did not send that application. He was like, yeah, we're only trying to find one. So the Edinburgh one, I'm like, there is no way that they're going to find one person all over the world, a welcome trust PhD. And I, I don't even have an undergrad yet. I'm literally in final year. And interestingly, I got it. I could not even believe that I got the Edinburgh one. So, so yeah, I, I'll say a lot of them, um, I just find it online. The Edinburgh one, I found it on the Welcome Trust website. So, um, yeah. Great. So I've been quite, there's a lot of luck happening. There's a lot of element <laughs> of luck. I mean, I, I think it's when opportunity meets preparedness. <laughs> The GRF at Wilson, I did not want to apply because I went to the University of Cambridge website and they're like, each position can have 250 applicants. I'm like, excuse me, you you get you take 10 GRFs every year and they're all different fields. And I was to my PhD supervisor, um, should I apply? He's like, sure. And then when I got in, I was literally the youngest. Everyone else was like further in their career. I'm just like, yeah. Yeah, I'm, so that it's a lot of imposter syndrome when I got into Cambridge. I'm like, um, you can't all possibly be the GRFs. What am I doing here? Sort of but it's but amazing yeah. how you how you worked through that and uh, still managed to be at the top of the game. So yeah, uh, you you are inspiring some and many of us. Uh, so keep keep keeping sure. on. <laughs> um, <clears throat> another question from me would be, um, what would you tell your younger self or someone who's still like someone who'd want to pursue a career in science as a woman especially from 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 the place we came from hmm. that's a very good point what will i tell my younger self i'm just trying to find my personal statement that my that i wrote 
okay. for my undergrad 10 years ago. My dad, <laughs> my parents still have it and my dad still reads it. So when I came home, he showed me and I just took a picture and what I, I just felt like I'll just read that now that you've asked the question mm-hmm. to know mm-hmm. what I would tell my younger self. Okay. It was literally everything I did set out to say that I wanted to achieve mm-hmm. that I did. So I'll tell my younger self that everything would actually work out in the end. Sorry, just give me one sec. Uh, yeah. I just... Yeah, sure. I just so can just get this. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Just take your time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I found it. Oh, you found it. Yeah. Okay. This is what I said. I said uh, it was a personal statement. I was writing to UCL for them to give me an offer. <laughs> I said, I hope my passion and talents are enough to help me improve the lives of many Gambians on my return home. A BSc in biochemistry would be a stepping stone to achieving my goals of earning a PhD in a life science. Becoming and becoming a and becoming a top research scientist, and what better place to study than in the UK? It is a country that opens its doors to international students and promotes academic success. The fact that I talked about finishing biochemistry, and this was even before when I was like in my final year high school, finishing a degree in biochemistry and ending up getting a PhD in a life science and coming back and working in Gambia. Sorry. Seventeen-year-old me. Yeah, oh, would have and thought that the fact that my dad still kept it, and the the page was really old because he printed it out for me when I was looking for scholarships, and I came this year. He's like, "You're back working in Gambia you're back. after your PhD in the UK." And this is ten. Yeah, and this is what you said you wanted to do ten years ago. Yeah. So <laughs> dreams yeah. do come true. I'll, I'll, I'll tell myself that it will be okay. You will be okay. So yeah, that's what I'll Absolutely. tell my mom. Yeah, sorry, I'm tearing up. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that, Umi. Um, do we have any questions from the audience uh, for Umi? Okay. Wait, am I reading? Okay, cool. Okay, Joshua, go ahead. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for preparing this. I'm actually new on the platform. I just followed the host on Twitter. And I happen to be an international student in China. Uh, The reason why I came to China is, oh, I'm from Uganda. And the reason why I came to China is, uh, I looked for scholarships, I applied, but uh, uh, they seemed so competitive. So the, the, the easier ones were to come to China. However, it was somehow, it is somehow different because uh, it's it's still biochemistry, but it's not uh, health related. So I yeah. found it a little, the, the, a little uh, different. Uh, where my supervisors are uh, telling me because I came with a plan of uh, of neuro of researching about neurodegenerative diseases. However, my supervisors say it's uh, it would take a lot of time and a lot of resources plus a lot of money. So they they, they give me another topic which I uh, I'm working on now. It's just a biotransformation of amino acids L to D amino acids for using in other fields, for example, pesticides and what. So I find it challenging, but uh, yeah, uh, if if you have any advice or I can take it up. Thank you so much, Joshua. Sorry, uh, are you doing an undergrad master's PhD if I think I missed that? Uh, I'm doing a uh, a, a master's degree in biochemistry and molecular oh. biology. Okay, and then the question is the topic that you're doing at the moment is not um, one that you're really interested in, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. You yeah. prefer another? Yeah, that, that is totally fine. Um, 
is a master's. But the good thing about science is that you can always change fields, right? What matters is that you have an opportunity to make the most of it. And um, you can always do something else and move to the field you're interested in during your PhD. You know, it's a master's thesis project. What matters is what you want to show when you're applying for PhDs is that you can actually successfully lead a research project and complete it and understand what you did. As long as you can show that, it doesn't matter. Like you can always learn. Like my PhD was complete. My undergrad was completely wet lab. I started my PhD not even knowing what print it in R was. I ended up doing it in bioinformatics. And that ends up working out. So I think one important thing that I think is important for a lot of us from the global south to understand is that unfortunately, due to the passports we carry, we have less opportunities than someone from the global north. And um, they probably would have, you know, it's easy for them to turn down stuff and wait for something else. But we don't have that option, unfortunately. So I think you've made the right choice by doing what you have, making the best of it, and you can always move on to do a PhD in something else. So yeah, that, um, I hope that answers your question. Oh, thank you. No worries. Right. <clears throat> Thanks, Joshua. And yeah, you, you can feel free to reach out to Umi later on if you wanna explore that conversation conversation further. Do we have anyone else that has a question for Umi? Um, just raise your hand. In the meantime, Umi, as as a champion for diversity in, in, in science, especially for for women. Um, do you do you think, do you know of any specific initiatives or programs that are sort of drive, trying to drive this uh, positive influence? Or what do you think we can do um, to sort of like increase, increase the representation in that space? That's a very good point. There are a lot of fellowships now uh, coming up in the UK, in the UK and uh, the US as well, focusing and targeting um, people of African descent, like the Excellent Fellowship. Um, there's a new one by the MRC Laboratory uh, in Cambridge that's trying to fund three British um, Black people in the UK. And um, the, the Royal Society has one, and that's for international. So there are things uh, coming up in IH. The Wellcome Trust recently announced a 20 million pound um, funding, and this is for people uh, of Black and Bangladeshi um, heritage. So there are a lot of um, opportunities coming up now compared to a few years ago, but I think they need to go a long way. Uh, it needs to be addressed why a lot of people from ethnic minorities um, who tend to Sometimes people in the UK come from a lower socioeconomic working class backgrounds, aren't staying in academia. It's because of the contracts, the lower pay compared to other industries. And as for women, I think a lot needs to be done because um, we do have so many women doing PhDs, but as you climb up the ladder, a lot of women drop out because um, childcare comes in, having to take care of their families, and there needs to be a lot more flexibility for mothers. Um, conferences in addition to giving a conference um, um bursary is important to also um add extra money for childcare so that when a mother comes can be able to travel to that conference with their baby and have childcare yeah. um, subsidized childcare as well that would help um keep more women um in science and being more flexible wait perfect <laughs> sorry um yeah, and then just still on that uh, sort of like uh, conversation, how have you personally been able, you know, I like asking these questions to women in science, um, how have you been able to strike the balance uh, between your social life and your career life and everything else involved um, in the middle? I'm um, striking the balance between social and career. Yeah. at the moment um uh, i don't have any caring responsibilities so i would say um i found it okay um but i try to always remember that people and friends and family is the most important and trying to keep that and always making time for hanging out with friends making time for visiting family um keeping relationships intact whilst also doing my work and having a work, a boundary. Like at this point, work is done. 
I am not going to look at it. Even if it's an email, I'm not going to respond to it sort of thing. Great. And then one final question from me would be, um, I'm also passionate about capacity building. I think there's someone. OK. And uh, um, uh, just regarding your fellowship, the Valley Gradual Fellowship, uh, the one that enabled you to do a bioinformatics workshop in the Gambia. Um, can you can you please elaborate on that and uh... okay so that workshop is not yet done we're gonna because there were okay. um, we needed raspberry pi computers and they were out of the market due mm -hmm. to the pandemic so but it was the student experience grant university of edinburgh and uh, i've always wanted to do a bioinformatics workshop in africa because i feel like because bioinformatics is not dependent on long reagent wait times and expensive reagents, mm -hmm. it will allow African scientists uh, potential to compete at the same level with their Western counterparts. So this is something that I always wanted to do. Uh, I remember, which is why I say sometimes rejection can be a redirection somewhere yeah, else. Yeah. I did apply yeah. to the Genetic Society UK um, to yeah. run this course because I designed this program with my thesis committee chair at the time. I did not get it. Uh, I tried the following year. Still did not get it. So I was like in my family, I'm like, oh, there's student experience grant. Why don't mm -hmm. I um put it in there? And it got funded. It was the same amount that I was looking for. So mm -hmm. um that's how that part came about. Um, which I which I'm very quite passionate about because I think one thing that's important is um building skills and making sure mm -hmm. that African scientists aren't just um doing research that uh is just they can actually have the resources to compete at the same level with their um, Western counterparts. And I think bioinformatics um, provides that opportunity. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, uh, I'm interested in, in that sort of um, thing. And I think I will, I will engage you more on that later on after this yeah. uh, conversation. Uh, but yeah, um, do we have anyone that has one last burning question before we close the meeting? Okay. Uh, yeah, I think I think your your not think actually your presentation was very elaborate, and I think a lot of questions that people would want to ask were sort of embedded within everything that you have discussed. And thank you so much for for being open uh, to share every um not everything to share the, <laughs> to share this with us. And yeah, and thank you for your time as well. Uh, you know, committing to do this in the midst of all the things that you are supposed to do. Um, we do not take it for granted. Thank you so much. Uh, so probably you uh, do you want to share one last um, a closing remark or just summary of anything that you would want to say before we close up? So I'll say thank you for inviting me. I remember we met at a conference in Cambridge yeah. and you told me about this and you know and thank you for all that you do for keeping um this on and everyone that's here today um thank you so much um for listening to me and um i really appreciate that and don't take it i don't take that for granted at all um one closing remark that i'll say is just i know it sounds very cliche but having a lot of self-belief i think and standing in your power uh, is very very important and um yeah i think that's that's one thing i'll say because imposter syndrome really really creeps in and cripples us and stops us from uh can prevent us from achieving our goals and applying for things and i think the more we try and build our self-confidence and believing in ourselves uh i think the better things will get so yeah that's what i'll say and again like i keep hammering this to myself it's like a daily mantra never reject yourself without giving a panel a chance to do so so apply yeah. for those things because the worst you will hear is a no. No one's gonna come pick you up. So yeah, that's all I'll say. Thank you. <laughs> that's so true. Thank you so much. Um. So uh. Yeah. In the comments, it's just how could we get this recording after? Thank you for sharing your knowledge. Okay. Yeah. Happiness says thank you as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Umi. So um, we will upload the recording on YouTube. Uh, so if you go to YouTube and just search my sense journey, you should be able to find find it there. But um, I think this should be done probably before by the end of next week. Yeah. 
Hope, hopefully that okay. answers your question. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Umi. Uh, when you come back to the UK, let me know. All right. All right. Thank you for having me. Bye. Bye. Bye.